Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dr. Roger Schwalt. He's been on the show several times before. He is a very popular guest. He's so popular, in fact, that he has his own YouTube channel with over a million and a half subscribers. His videos are incredible. I suggest you check it out. There's a link below to subscribe to his channel. He actually is a real doctor, like he works. He's quadruple board certified. And when I lived in the desert, I was privileged to have him as my doctor. Now I'm not, but I have his friend as my doctor now. So pretty good. Please welcome him back to the show to talk about sunlight where we don't have any up here, apparently. <laughs> well, Hi, thanks doctor. so much. Thank you so Thank much, you. Chef, for having me on the uh, on the show. Oh my God. Are you kidding? It's such an honor to have you on. You, you are so passionate about so many topics, but this is a very interesting topic, especially since I went from the desert where all we had was sun to a climate where we don't seem to have it as much. And why is it so important? Yeah. And you know, it's funny, you just move from one part of the state to another, and that just kind of shows you the diversity of California. You can, you can have just about any kind of weather pattern any time of year. Yeah. yeah so it, cause you're, you're, there's a lot of questions about people that live in places like Canada that really, they don't seem to have sun. Yeah. So we're going to talk about sunlight and its uh, impact not only on on diets which i know is near and dear to your heart but also on over metabolic health which i know you're also interested in and uh, and just general health and this is a topic that i think for for most people if, if they're anything like i was when i first started learning about this even after i went through medical school they believe that oh yeah the sun it's important vitamin d yeah i get it no it's it's way more than vitamin D. It's actually, vitamin D is just one small piece of the health benefits that we get from the sun. We can touch on a number of those aspects. Uh, there's a whole uh, there's a whole area that's well known that has to do with mood, depression. Um, there's a part in your brain. We'll, we'll, we'll talk some technicalities here, but I'll make it very simple so it's very easily accessible. There's a there's a part of your brain called the perihabenular nucleus that gets nerve endings from your eyeballs, basically. And so when you are in light, this part of your brain actually uh, is stimulated and it actually prevents depression. We're not going to talk much about that today, but that's another area that's well known. That's right off the bat, another benefit of sunlight. And people can get something called seasonal affective disorder when they don't get enough light. So we'll we'll talk about, we can talk briefly touch on that later. But what I want to talk about is the new and hot research uh, that is, this is all evidence-based. And I, I'll talk a little bit about how we've put this into practice about the energy that's coming from the sun in the form of what we call near infrared radiation and what that does to our body and it's really kind of mind-blowing you're going to have to sit down you're going to please stick with me on this video okay because <laughs> we're going to be getting into some stuff that i think is really life-changing and when i've explained this to people this single topic and what we're going about to talk about has completely changed their lives and i'm i'm not being hyperbolic here i'm really telling you the truth and uh and i think it's going to be very powerful and worth your while to listen to to what we're going to say today how did you get interested in this topic i was forced to get uh, into this topic because i realized at the beginning of the pandemic uh, a, a pandemic, by the way, that primarily affects the lungs, and I'm a lung doctor. And um, not only am I working in the in the clinic, but I'm also working in the intensive care unit. And I knew that these people were going to be coming in. And the question was, is what, this is early 2020, what am I going to do? How am I going to treat these patients? What is it that's going to happen? Because I know I'm going to be in a situation where this is happening, and not only for my patients, but also for myself and my family. And so instead of, of uh, looking into the literature, which we had nothing of, I was forced to go back to a time when we didn't have antibiotics, when we didn't have a lot of the modern technology that we have, and ask the question, you know, this is not the first time a pandemic has come around. What did they do? And what is the science telling us today about the inter interventions that they did 100 years ago? And that's why I was, basically, I was forced to do it in my own mind, just my own values and what it is that I wanted to do with patients forced me to look into this topic. Wow, that's yeah, because I, I actually heard about the topic before you were booked on the show from Dr. Nedley, because you shared some some reports of a patient that was really helped by just getting outside. 
Yeah, and as you can see here, normally in my office, um, I, I sort of block out the sun. It's it's in the morning. The sun is coming up in the east, and you can kind of see it. It might be messing up a little bit of my <laughs> my studio here, but uh, this sun is is actually really nice. Uh, and we'll we'll get into exactly why it is. So let's start from the very beginning. Um, light. What is light? It's more than just something that allows you to see what you're doing. One thing that you have to understand very clearly is that there is a lot more to light than meets the eye because there, there is energy that comes from the sun that we cannot see. The visible spectrum that we see out of all of the energy that comes from the sun is less than 39% of that energy. More than 50% of that energy comes in the form of ultraviolet and near-infrared radiation. In fact, the majority of it is near-infrared. So let me explain what this is. You know the colors of the rainbow, of course. Roy G. Biv, right? It's uh, red, it's orange, orange, yellow, yellow green, green, blue, blue indigo, violet. violet. Yeah, exactly. Um, and indigo, violet. So we're not talking about the colors that we can't see beyond uh, violet. That's ultraviolet light. And that's what gives us vitamin D, uh, among other things. It's also actually kind of damaging to the skin if you don't have good protection on. That's why we always try to block UV uh, if we can. But we want to go to the other extreme. So the, the type of light that we see before near infrared, and that's called, uh, sorry, before red, which is near infrared. This is the majority of the energy that we're actually getting from the sun. And what's very important to understand about this type of energy is that this type of energy can penetrate through substances very easily. That's important to understand because let's just start from the very, very top. When the sun is directly overhead. That's when all the forms of light energy from the sun, visible light, uh, um, uh, ultraviolet light, and also near infrared light can come through the atmosphere very easily because it's at that point when the sun is directly overhead that the atmosphere is the thinnest. But when the sun is rising and setting, it has to cut through more of the atmosphere. And as a result of that, you get less ultraviolet light, which, which can't penetrate through very well. But the amount of near-infrared light can penetrate through very well, even at those low levels. And we'll talk more about this when we talk about those who are living, for instance, in Canada at very high latitudes, when we start talking about the studies that have been done. To put it, uh, to, to put it in another way, you can all remember a time when you're driving on the streets and you pull up to a stoplight and that that person next to you pulls up in their car and they're playing that thing that they call music, right? <laughs> Whether it's rap music or whatever, what do you hear? You hear the low frequency tones and it's because energy in the low frequency is able to penetrate very easily through not only their car, but your car and actually vibrate the, your steering wheel, right? Kind of in an annoying way. It's not the high frequency sounds that you hear. Those get blocked, but it's the low frequency. And that's exactly the same situation here with light. It's the low frequency energy in the light spectrum. We're talking about the reds, the, the, the near infrareds. These things, these, this, this energy has the ability to penetrate through the atmosphere. It has the ability to penetrate through the, 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 um, the, the atmosphere all the way down to your skin. And this is important. It not only can penetrate through the atmosphere, it can also penetrate through your skin as well. And it can actually go fairly deep. Some estimates is up to uh, eight, eight centimeters. There's a, um, there is a um, astronomist in the, in the European Union by the name of Robert Fosbury. He's out of the UK and uh, he's worked with NASA before. He's worked with the European Space Agency. And when he heard me talking about this on our YouTube channel, he actually uh, wrote me and sent me a photograph. And he's he's really into this topic, actually, of near-infrared radiation, uh, being an astronomer, and, and light, and life on Earth, and just very big philosophical topics that he talks about. But he also gets into the science. And what he did was he took a picture of his hand with a a near-infrared light source behind it. And, he's, and he took the photograph and he sent it to me. And what near-infrared radiation does is it scatters. So it goes, it penetrates through the first couple of millimeters of your skin, and then it just bounces around. And so his hand looked like the whole hand was just illuminated with light, uh, even though it was coming from behind. The light source was from behind. He was blocking the light that we would normally see visually. But in the infrared spectrum, his whole hand lit up. And what was very interesting about that photograph was that it's not like you could see bones 
in there, like, you know, like an x-ray, like you could see the bones. You could not see the bones. It, the light went through it as if the bones did not exist because they scattered through it and around it. Uh, and that's a really important topic to understand because we're going to talk about the effect of near infrared lights on our cells in our body. And that may seem kind of crazy because you're like, why would the cells in our body need to have light? They're under our skin. They can't see lights. Well, in actuality, that's that's actually incorrect. Um, and what you may, if you want to sort of prove this to yourself, um, you can even do this. You can go outside on a warm, sunny day. You might not have that where you are right now, but if the sun comes up and you put on some clothes, uh, even even just a thin a thin jacket, in fact, or, or t-shirt, and close your eyes and and you you can actually turn around and feel where that sun is because you, what you're feeling is you're feeling the near infrared radiation from the sun penetrating through your jacket, penetrating through your t-shirt, hitting your skin, going deep down and actually uh, uh, stimulating the heat receptors in your in the deep aspects of your skin. Now, if that's not enough, we can also talk about um, what we what I do as a physician when I examine patients. Um, there is uh, something called sinusitis. You know, in your in your head, you've got these cavities called sinuses. Both up here, they're the frontal sinus, and then down here, there's the maxillary sinus. That's actually a pretty big sinus. And sometimes those sinuses can get filled up with with fluid, pus, and we call this sinusitis. It's a very painful uh, condition. It's really annoying to have. Well, one of the things that we can do on a physical exam to figure out whether or not someone, for instance, has a maxillary sinusitis is we can take a very powerful pen light and put the pen light right here on the maxillary sinus. And then we have them open their mouth like this. And we look in a dark room at the roof of their mouth inside their mouth. And if we see the, the illumination of light coming through then we know that uh, the sinuses are nice and empty and there's no pus or fluid in there. Uh, but obviously the pus and fluid will block that. Um, but that, think about that. The light is penetrating through your skin, through the fascia, through the subcutaneous uh, tissue, going through the maxillary sinus bone. It's then going through the airspace, hitting the other side, going through the bone and then popping through. So that's, that's an example of visible light a visible light being able to penetrate through bone. Just think how much more near infrared light can, can do that. So it's really quite amazing, um, Chef AJ, about how this light thing, like we would think that, you know, light would be blocked by the skin. No, there are certain aspects of light that we cannot see that can penetrate through our clothes and our skin. Wow. Incredible. Yeah, you, you know, uh, this might be this might be dating me a little bit here, but you you can remember, <laughs> you can, can you remember back in the 1990s when Sony was coming out with his camcorders, right? This is when we used to carry cameras around to take videos of things. You had to take them to birthday parties or to you know graduations. Anyway, uh, there was this new technology that came out uh, that where you could actually use infrared sensors, and it was. It was done this way so you could see things at night better. It was like a night vision type of, of uh, enhancement of the camera. Well, uh, a couple of uh, engineering uh, young minds that uh, didn't have enough time on their hand or had too much time on their hands uh, figured out how to do this even in the day. And what they were able to do with this near-infrared light is actually see through clothes. Uh, Sony figured this out and they had to pull the, the, the camcorder off the market but this, why was why were they able to do this? Because sun, the sunlight is able to penetrate through the clothes. Some of it does bounce off the skin, and that light comes through the clothes because again, it's near infrared. So the key point that I want you to understand here is that, and this is very, very important, is that we have near infrared light that can penetrate through clothes on one end of the visible spectrum coming from the sun. But on the other end of the visible spectrum, we have ultraviolet light, which cannot. Now, it's the ultraviolet light that damages and has uh, the type of energy, the ionizing energy that can cause skin cancer and and damaging the skin. So if you're like if you're like some <laughs> a lot of people, you're like, well, I, I try to avoid the sun because I don't want it to damage my skin. I want my skin to look young. And what I'm here to tell you 
is that near infrared light does not damage your skin. In fact, near infrared light replenishes your skin. Have you have you seen these devices uh, that you can put on your face and they have these this red light that penetrates into the skin and it and it causes increased energy production and it increases collagen deposition and makes your skin look more healthy. That actually is in the near infrared light. What you're trying to avoid is ultraviolet. And here's the point that I want you to understand very clearly is that being in the shade, being outside, but in the shade or covering up allows you to get that near infrared radiation without being exposed overtly to ultraviolet radiation. And furthermore, um, when the sun is very low in the sky, that's actually one of the most ideal times to be out there in the sun because the sun is so low in the sky the damaging effects of ultraviolet radiation is not coming in as much, but you're actually getting a, a higher proportion of, of near infrared radiation, which the, the valuable type of, of sunlight. So getting outside, or if, if you don't want to expose yourself directly to the sun by covering up, getting outside in the morning and in the evening are the ideal times to get a lot of this uh, near infrared radiation, which uh, coming up right now here, we'll talk about exactly physiologically what's going on and what the evidence is uh, for the, those health benefits. I just want to ask a question. How do we get the tight? And actually I have the sun coming in now too. Good so for I'm you. All right. <laughs> but just for visually, I might just close the shade in just a moment. But how do we get the sun we need without getting the sun we don't need? Because I, okay, so here's the thing. So I lived in LA for the first 60 years of my life and I never used sunscreen. I never paid attention. I just figured I'm not going to age. And then when I moved to the desert where they see so much skin cancer, they basically read me the riot act and they and my skin was in terrible shape. They burned a lot of stuff off and they told me I had to cover up. And this was before the pandemic. So I started wearing a full coverage hat, like, you know, the kind where you literally only see the eyes. Can you still do that and wear sunscreen and get the beneficial effects that you need? Yeah, I mean, it does decrease it a little bit because you do lose a little bit of that energy when you cover up. But uh, near infrared radiation will penetrate through sunscreen. Near infrared radiation will penetrate through uh, your clothes um, and also a hat. Uh, so, yes, it will happen. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what are the things that can really enhance near infrared radiation. Um, uh, we'll talk about that. But yes, you you the the ways to minimize the maximize near infrared radiation and minimize ultraviolet, it would be to do exactly those things. Um, but realize that the more clothes and more things that you put on, there there is a reduction in it and you would have to be outside for a little bit longer, but it does come through. Okay. Well, I, I only worry about my face, the skin on my face. I let my arms and legs do whatever they want. Yes, <laughs> but but realize that you can get skin damage there too. And, and uh, you know, melanoma is definitely one of those things. But interestingly, there have been some studies that have shown one of those studies is called the South Sweden study. So SSS, South Sweden study, where they looked at uh, tens of thousands of Swedish women. And you, obviously these are fair skinned individuals uh, who are at risk for this type of disease. And they actually found that Increased sun exposure actually reduced the mortality from melanoma. Uh, increased sun exposure was actually associated with a longer survival. Increased sun exposure uh, reduced uh, mortality. And this was in Sweden. These were in fair skin people at higher latitudes. Wow. But what about people where they actually live places where there's there, there is no sun or very little sun? Yeah. So uh, particularly at the extreme poles, the, you'll have situations in the summertime where the sun never sets and in the wintertime where the sun never comes up. And those are extreme situations. And, and we can talk about mitigation effects and things that you can do to prevent, for instance, seasonal affective disorder. But um, it's not ideal. These are not ideal uh, living situations. The human body was not uh, designed, let's say, to to live in these kind of areas. But that being said, there are things that you can do to lessen those effects. So um, a, a near infrared lamp, um, uh, getting uh, exposure to light in the morning time, especially in the morning time, that anchors your circadian rhythm. Um, you have the opposite effects in the summertime. That's at night when the sun never sets. And it's really important to be able to pull the shades down and have a very dark room. So what you'll find out is that our circadian rhythm is really important. And that when the sun is up, that's when it's really important for human beings to get sun. And when the sun is down, that's it's a time really what's really important for us to avoid as much light as possible. And this is the ideal 
for our body. So staying up late, watching television, being on your iPad, iPhone, doing a work on a, on a light device after the sun goes down is going to be detrimental for your health. And staying inside while the sun is up, generally speaking, is going to be detrimental for your health unless you're getting enough sun exposure. So um, let me talk really briefly about what it is that you can do to really maximize near infrared radiation. And, and this is not just by a small amount. Actually, you could almost double the amount of near infrared radiation that you're getting on any particular day just by doing this one thing. And it's really surprising um, when I found out about it, but being in a green environment, and I'm not just talking about the color green, I'm talking about leaves, bushes, and trees. Now, why is that? For some reason, the, the, the leaf of a tree, uh, obviously where there is uh, there are substances that absorb light, like chlorophyll absorbs light in the reds and the blues, but something that it does a very, an amazing job of more than any other thing is that it reflects near infrared light from the sun at very, very high levels. Uh, Chef AJ, have you ever done this? Have you ever gone in, into a, a forest and it's a hot day out and you're you're walking around, there's a number of trees. What do you notice as soon as you walk under a tree? What do you notice the first thing? It's cooler. It, it is. It's, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's because you are, you are walking under a, it's even cooler under a tree than it is, let's say, under a man-made uh, shelter. And that's because the man-made shelter does not reflect near infrared light. You can't see this, but if you ever were to try this, do this, go to Google and uh, go to Google images and type in near infrared photography. And what you will see almost certainly when it pops up is you will see photographs of trees, of plants, and the tr and the leaves on the trees and the grass look like they are light bulbs because they are reflecting at such a high amount and in intensity uh, uh, this near-infrared light. By the way, this near-infrared light, which has no damaging effects on the skin, no, no risk of melanoma. And so here's the point, and, and it's really quite interesting because we've known this data for years. We just didn't understand why. We've known for years that people who live in green spaces, people who grow up in green spaces, have less diabetes, less hypertension, have better quality of life, less metabolic issues than people who live and grow up in concrete jungles. And what I mean by that is the city. So even in the city, having uh, living near to a park or visiting a park, what you're getting there is you're getting a tremendous, you're doubling essentially the amount of near infrared light that is coming to your body because these are like solar reflectors that are reflecting this good light to your body and it's penetrating through your clothes, through your skin and going down deep into your body. So um, the best, absolutely the best thing to do to get the benefit from light is to go outside in the morning when the sun is coming up, when there's very little ultraviolet radiation uh, and getting not only the sun directly from the sun, but also getting it reflected off of you, around you by trees and plants. You know, I think about, you know, I used to work at a retirement home and I think about all the elderly people, like they literally never, ever went outside, ever. Yeah, and we'll talk about that uh, more when we talk about COVID. Do you know who the first patients were in my hospital when the COVID wave hit? We basically cleaned out the nursing homes. They they were, they were basically, there was a mass transfer of patients to our hospital for nursing home patients. And you're exactly correct. Uh, these patients were not... Uh, getting enough sunlight. And you may say, well, this is vitamin D. And you're absolutely right. Uh, vitamin D is a small por uh, area of this, but it actually gets into a lot more than just vitamin D. So I don't want anyone to think, but if, if there's one thing people learn from this talk, it's that if you're take, if you're supplementing with vitamin D, and that's not a bad thing to do, I supplement with vitamin D. However, supplementing with vitamin D is not an excuse. It doesn't clear you or cause you to say, because I'm taking vitamin D, I don't need to go out into the sun. So we'll talk about the physiology of why that's so important. Thank you. Yeah. So, so basically uh, let's just review vitamin D is a, is a, is a hormone that is made in the surface of your skin. And the thing that has to make it is ultraviolet radiation. Okay. So uh, that's why uh, ultraviolet is very scarce, especially at high latitudes. Remember what we talked about ultraviolet light has difficulty penetrating through the atmosphere. 
uh, especially when the sun is low. And so people who live in Canada, people who live in high latitudes in the United States are not going to get enough ultraviolet radiation. You can overcome that by supplementing with vitamin D. That's no problem. Here's the good news. The good news is, is that near infrared light is beneficial to the human body and it can happen so long as you're seeing the sun. If you can see the sun, you're getting near infrared radiation by definition because it can penetrate through just about anything. Okay, so let's talk about what the actual mechanism is. So in your in almost every cell of your body, except for perhaps red blood cells, there is an engine and that engine is known as the mitochondria. OK, so the mitochondria is this little tell, tiny uh, organelle in all of your cells. There's multiple of them and their job is to make energy. But just like the engine in your car is, re, is, is there to make your wheels turn, you know that when your engine is working, it can get hot. And if you don't cool that engine down, it's going to seize up and you're going to lose the, uh, the ability of that engine to actually turn the wheels. That's when the engine seizes up and you're off the side of the road and steam is coming out of your engine. Unfortunately, that's what happened to a lot of people uh, when they get sick, when they have metabolic problems, is that those engines are not able to do their job and make energy. And the reason is, is because they also make heat, but not heat in the regular sense. They actually make chemical heat. And that is called reactive oxygen species or oxidative stress. You may have heard these terms before. Oxidative stress is the result of your mitochondria doing the job that it needs to do. So how does the body get rid of this thing called oxidative stress? There are two systems that your body has set up to deal with this. One system is at night. And that is from the secretion of melatonin, which is a beneficial hormone, beneficial compound that is secreted in your brain that goes into your blood. And this, this hormone, this, this substance called melatonin is a very powerful antioxidant. It mops up that reactive oxygen species. It mops up the oxidative stress that is, that is, uh, uh, produced by your mitochondria. It's like a cooling system for your engine. And so that's what happens at night. The problem is, is that if you expose your eyes to light at night, it will shut down melatonin production. And we have plenty of data that pe that shows that people who do night shift work, people who stay up late, people who do, don't get enough sleep, these people are at increased risk for mitochondrial dysfunction. They have a higher risk of diabetes. They have a higher risk of high blood pressure. They even have a higher risk of cancer. Okay, so this is really important to understand. Now, that takes care of the night. What is the body system that is in place for taking care of the system during the day? Well, it's the same substance. It's melatonin. But this time, instead of the melatonin coming from the brain at night, the melatonin is made on site in each of your cells in the mitochondria. And this is really important because it's like the cooling system is integrated in with the engine right at the area where the heat is being produced so that you, you don't get damage. What they find, though, is the thing that stimulates this melatonin production in the mitochondria itself is exposure to near infrared radiation. So let's connect the dots here. Your body has these little engines and they need to be cooled down in a sense, and I'm using that as an analogy to prevent them from creating reactive oxygen species. So when you're in the sun, this stimulates the mitochondria to make this beneficial compound called melatonin that cools down the engine right there in the cell where it's needed. You can't get this type of melatonin in the cell by taking melatonin supplements. So I don't want you to go out and take melatonin supplements because that's gonna go into your blood. We don't want the melatonin in the blood. Uh, because it's going to tell your body that it's time to sleep. We need a system in place to cool down your mitochondria in the daytime without telling your body it's time for sleep. And the way that's done is to produce it in the cells right where it's needed. And the way to do that is to get near infrared radiation. Now, this is important to understand because the mitochondria not working has been tied to many, many different diseases and disorders in the United States. Let's go through a couple. If you go to the Cleveland Clinic website and you type in Cleveland Clinic mitochondrial dysfunction causes, you will see a whole list. And that list basically reads 
as a list of common diseases in the United States, diabetes, hypertension, dementia, even autism is linked. 80%, they, they did a study once that 80% of people that have autism spectrum disorder have direct ties to mitochondrial dysfunction. And let's think about it, uh, Chef AJ, if you think about what our life has been, they actually did a study on this. In modern United States, we spend only about 7% of our waking hours outside without a roof over our head. We get up in the morning, we go to our garage, we get into our car, we drive to our underground parking structure, we go to our office, we, uh, we have lunch delivered, we come back to our car, we drive home, we go into our uh, garage, and it's possible for huge swaths of the air that we are not even seeing the sun. And yet the sun is so beneficial for us to actually get that melatonin that we actually need. Now, let me, um, anything to, to remark there? Any questions? No, I, I mean, it's, this is just a fascinating topic and this is not something that's being discussed by most people or most doctors, you know? No, this is not. And it's it's the research is, is currently underway. So let me make the next, uh, let me make the next logical step here. And uh, one of the big diseases that is not on that list that I just talked about, it, it actually is on the list, but I haven't mentioned it yet. And it's really important where I want to go next is, is COVID-19 and the flu. In fact, just about any respiratory disorder is going to be related to mitochondrial dysfunction. So, so let, me, uh, ex let me explain further. Let's talk about COVID. Um, the, everybody knows about the spike protein on the, on the SARS-CoV-2 viral particle. This, the spike protein actually interacts with the receptor on the cell called the ACE2 receptor. People have heard this expression before. Uh, this is more than just a receptor on the cell. This ACE2 receptor on the cell is also an enzyme. And it's a very important enzyme in terms of its ability to uh, cause the oxidative stress in the body to be one way versus the other. Think of ACE2 as also a cooling system for the cell, okay? So what's happening here is, I want you to picture this in terms of a car. Imagine your car is not very healthy. The cooling system works, but it's not working optimally. So what's going to happen if you're driving your car and you all of a sudden start to hit this big hill that you've got to climb and your cooling system is not so good. So you're going to have to rev up the engine and it's very possible that you may not even make it up the hill. Your 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 uh, heat in the engine will go up very high. Steam will start to come up and you're going to have to stop your car and pull over to the side of the road. That's exactly what I believe happened to a lot of people during COVID who were not optimally cooled. Their mitochondria were not optimally cooled. So here's what's going on. is The mitochondria is dysfunctional, it's chugging along. And now all of a sudden, here comes a, a viral infection that knocks out one of your systems for oxidative stress mitigation. And what happens is now your body, the, the cell becomes dysfunctional and it breaks down and it causes blood clots to occur. We can get into the detail of that, but that's a little bit beyond. But this is exactly what's happening. So it would stand to reason that if that's the case, that if you, if somebody were to optimize their ability to, uh, to uh, mitigate the oxidative stress in your cells, that you would be able to better weather the storm of a COVID pandemic. Uh, in other words, if your cooling system in your car was robust, if you had changed the water pump, filled up the radiator, done all these things that you might have made it up the hill much better than you if you had not done that. And what I'm saying is that sunlight is the way to tune up, to optimize the oxidative stress systems in your cell. And, and, and the reason why I say that, again, is because sunlight has been shown to increase melatonin, which by the way, is one of the most powerful antioxidants known to man. Um, it even upregulates the glutathione system. So if you think the glutathione system is important, this is the king of the glutathione system because melatonin itself upregulates glutathione. So if you want to go right to the source, right to the power, melatonin is the best, number one. Number two, the way you get it at night is by making sure you're not exposed to light. Number three, the way you get it during the day is to get outside for about 20 to 30 minutes. Okay, so 
so let's actually get to some studies. It's all nice and, and theoretical to talk about these things in the cell. What's the actual evidence? What's the proof? So what they, they did a study, <clears throat> the first thing they did was they looked back at 2020 and they said, hmm, I remember when COVID was taking off and, and, and each country in Europe had its own period of time when the surge started to pick up. You remember these surges, right? In Europe uh, and, and patients started going to the hospital. So they asked this question. They said, what was it that caused the surges in each of these countries? Because each of these countries are, are a little bit different. They have different latitudes. Some of them have different weather patterns. They have different temperatures and they have different humidities. And they asked this question, um, is there a correlation with humidity with temperature or with latitude in terms of when the autumn surge occurred back in 2020 in Europe. And so they looked at temperature and they looked at uh, a number of different countries. There was absolutely no correlation with temperature. Temperature did not affect when the surge came in in that country. Then they looked at humidity. Uh, and again, it did not show any correlation whatsoever. However, when they looked at latitude, there was an there was almost a seventy percent uh, relational co co uh, correlation coefficient with latitude. What I mean to say is that the countries that were the most northern were the first ones to get the COVID surges, and the ones at the south were the last ones to get the COVID surges. So, if you can imagine, as we're heading into fall and into winter, that's when the sun. Uh, sorry, well, the, the earth is tilting away in the northern hemisphere, away from the sun. And so as it starts to tilt, which countries are going to be the ones that are going to be the first to hit that threshold where they're getting less hours of daylight? It's going to be the ones the most, most north. And so in, true, in fact, Finland was the first one to get their uh, surge. And the last one to get their surge that year was Greece, which is in the, the furthest south. So this was very intriguing to a lot of scientists. It showed to them that the sun had a lot to do with when COVID came on. And this, this wasn't a surprise to many of them because we see this even right now. We see that, that the flu comes on and the flu season peaks right after the uh, winter um, uh, solstice, which is December 21st. And so we're headed right into the maximum peak uh, time of the year where we start to see the most flu. And I can tell you, Chef AJ, I just did a whole week in the ICU, just, just got off last night. And I already have two cases of flu that are coming in very severe cases. So we're, we're seeing it already. Um, there was a, there was a study actually that was published looking at New York State versus the areas, and the, the scientists came to the conclusion that sunlight exposure, they said, quote, is very protective against influenza. This is published in a scientific journal, so sunlight is really important. Okay, so going back to the COVID, though, um, so scientists started to look at this very carefully, and they, they said there's something about latitude that seems to be the case. So what they decided to say, well, is this vitamin D or is this something else? So they did a very intriguing study, and I think this is this is the, the study that really broke it for me, is they looked at the United States in the wintertime, okay? And they know exactly where in the United States during the winter people can get enough ultraviolet radiation to make vitamin D and those that can't. And generally, it's kind of like where you are right now, Chef AG, kind of there in, in Sacramento is where the line sort of goes across. Anyone below that is still going to get enough vitamin D even in the wintertime in the United States. Uh, it's kind of like that line that's parallel to Tennessee. If you take that all the way across, anybody north of that is not going to get enough ultraviolet light in the wintertime uh, because ultraviolet light is not going to be able to penetrate through at that high latitude. So what they did is they said, okay, here's an area of the United States in the north part of the United States. There's no way that they can get enough vitamin D during the wintertime. Let's see whether or not latitude in that in that in just that area predicts COVID-19 mortality. And you know what they found? They found that those that the the more north you lived, the higher the COVID-19 mortality was. And the more south you lived, the less COVID-19 mortality there was. And this whole area was in an area where nobody was getting any vitamin D. Okay. So what does that tell you? It tells you that sunlight exposure is doing something to the human body outside of vitamin D that is protective. In fact, the authors of this study said, they said, 
we don't know if this is causal or not causal, but it does seem to predict that sunlight exposure could be a public health intervention for diseases like COVID-19. And they're absolutely correct. So this really got me interested because this sort of told me that something that I, I had, had realized for a long time, there's no question. It's not even a debate. It's not controversial. We know that people who come into the hospital with higher levels of vitamin D do better in terms of COVID-19 and the flu. And those people that come into the hospital with lower levels of vitamin D don't do as well. Now, what some people thought was, is that, well, this, you know, very simplistic thinking here, if we can just give them vitamin D, they'll do better and they'll, they'll be able to go home. What I'm saying is I think it's more complicated than that. In that, I believe the vitamin D that we're seeing in these patients Yes, they're higher, but it may be a marker of something else that's actually doing the heavy lifting when it comes to COVID-19 mortality. And it may be a marker of sun exposure. In other words, the more vitamin D somebody has naturally, that's a marker that tells me this person is out in the sun. And it may be that sun exposure that's doing far more. What's the proof of that? The study that I just mentioned. These are people that could not have gotten enough vitamin D, period. But yet we still saw that the more time they spent in the sun, the better their COVID-19 mortality. So that was that was really interesting for me. So the thing that really sealed the deal was a randomized control trial. So let me just back up and just say this. <clears throat> the types of studies that I've been talking about up to this point are correlation studies. They are epidemiological studies. You cannot show causation with those types of studies. OK, correlation does not equal causation. You'll hear that over and over again. The only way you can really show causation, in other words, to show that A is causing B, that A, an intervention A actually makes an improvement is to do a randomized control trial. OK, and that's exactly what a group from Brazil did. Now, think about this. This is mind blowing that they had the the understanding of all of this to do this. So they took patients diagnosed with covid in the hospital that were not sick enough to be requiring ventilation in the intensive care unit. So the, again, so these are mild to moderate COVID-19 patients, all of them requiring oxygen. And what they did was they made this, they actually made this jacket, okay? This was a flexible jacket that they were able to put on patients. And on the inside of that jacket, they made these LED bulbs. But these LED bulbs did not give off visible light. They gave off near infrared light at 940 nanometers, that's the wavelength. So scientists can identify exactly which wavelength this was. And, and so if you were to look at this jacket and I were to turn on the jacket, you could not tell if the jacket was on because the light coming from these bulbs uh, is not visible light. Does that make sense? Okay, mm -hmm. so what they did was they put these jackets on and in the placebo group, they left the switch off. Okay, they didn't they didn't turn the switch on. So the patient got the jacket, they got all the other stuff that was associated with putting on the jacket, all of this, the attention, all of those things. That was the placebo. But in the intervention arm, they just switched on the jacket. Okay. So the theory is, is that if it's near infrared radiation from the sun that is uh, causing the improvement in mortality in these patients, we should be able to reproduce that uh, in patients using a randomized control trial. And if it shows that those patients that had the intervention improved, then we could show causation because it's randomized and it's a placebo controlled trial. So this is what you need for causation. Chef AJ, when I tell you the results of this study were incredible, there were only 30 subjects in the study. And some people might see that as a, as a downside to the study, that it wasn't a large study. But let me tell you, if you're able to do a study with just 30 patients and you're able to see statistically significant differences, that tells you that the power of the intervention is great. The, the patients who had the jacket were discharged from the hospital four days earlier. Four days earlier. That's incredible. That's an incredible amount of time. A lot of let me give you an, let me give you an example. Tamiflu, which is the medication intervention for the flu, it's been shown in studies to shorten the symptoms of the flu by guess how much? One day. Oh, one day. One day. That's that's why we give Tamiflu is because people will have symptoms of the flu one day less. Okay, this this intervention with near infrared radiation reduced the time 
that the patient was in the hospital by four days. Do you know how, mu how much it costs to stay in the hospital? Just to have a room. It's it's more expensive than the fancier, fanciest hotel that you've ever been in because uh, you have a you have a maitre d' at your bedside uh, almost 24 hours a day. Um, and you have, of course, you have hospital food, which is not as good as the uh, the peninsula in Hollywood uh, or or the uh, the um, uh, the Ritz Carlton. But you understand what I'm saying. It's ex terribly expensive. And if you could shorten the hospitalization of COVID patients by four days just by doing this intervention, um, that would be incredible. But you might ask, OK, well, why was it shortened uh, by four days? Well, they, they did a number of studies and looked at this. They did pulmonary function tests. They looked at the blood in these patients and they looked at the oxygen. And in every one of those categories, there was an improvement over in the placebo. So this really solidified in my mind that there's no question that sunlight is beneficial. So this you might think that this is like, wow, this is an amazing discovery. It's not a discovery, Chef AJ. It's actually a rediscovery. Because when I went back and looked 100 years ago, do you know that prior to antibiotics, prior to uh, a lot of these medications, which I'm not against, by the way, uh, I, I can tell you as a critical care physician that I have saved many patients' lives by the judicious use of medication when it was needed. Okay, there's no question about that. Um, that's not to say that I didn't direct these patients to a lifestyle change that hopefully in the future would negate the, the, the need for medications, but medications can be used judiciously at the time when they're needed to save someone's life. And I have used medications, no question. However, before we had these medications in the 1910s, 20s, even in the 1800s, do you know that we built hospitals around the idea of fresh air and sunlight? Uh, Florence Nightingale was a, a, a real um, uh, uh, pathfinder in, in this area. And so uh, it was amazing. I saw these old black and white photographs of the entire hospital ward coming outside for their heliotherapy and for their, their therapy. We would, the, 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 the actual architecture of the rooms of the patients were designed so the beds could be moved out onto the patio and patients could spend their time outside in the sun. Um, there were whole tuberculosis sanatoriums that were designed at high altitude because tuberculosis doesn't like lack of oxygen and there's less oxygen at altitude. But there's also, as we just talked about, more ultraviolet light that can actually kill these germs, more infrared radiation. And believe it or not, these sanatoriums back in the 1800s had a 80% cure rate on an infectious disease that it, that today takes us six to nine months to treat with four different types of drugs, six to nine months. So usually it's it's uh, it's uh, four drugs for two months and two drugs for four months after that. But with if we were to take all of that away, we could still achieve 80% success rates just by getting patients out into the sun, up at high altitude. And I'm not saying that we should not treat people with, with antibiotics, but but why throw out, why, why, why is it an either or argument? Why can't it be an and argument? And so I'll just, I'll just finish this aspect of it with this. I, I, I came across this information. I came across all of these studies during the period of time after the major surges of COVID. And so I never really had a good opportunity to put it into practice in my own situation. But about uh, three weeks ago, I had a patient at my hospital and they called me. They said, Dr. Schwelt, we have a patient on the floor. Uh, I'm, I'm the intensive care doctor. So they usually get me involved when things are going bad. So I was, I was asked to see a gentleman uh, in his 70s, who uh, had recently been diagnosed with COVID about a week or, or a week and a half prior to this. And uh, he had been given some treatment, but he was at home and it was just not getting better, getting worse, getting worse. Finally, he came into the hospital with COVID. He was placed on a few liters of oxygen because that's what he needed at the time. And he was given the standard treatment on the floor. He was given steroids, um, and he was given, you know, the vitamins that we normally give patients, uh, vitamin D, zinc, those sorts of things. But he continued to get worse. And they called me at the point where he was on what we call high flow oxygen. So 35 liters, 100% FiO2. And I was floored because I had not seen a patient like this 
for a very long time. It had been almost a year. And I was almost like PTSD because I was getting into my uh, gown. I was getting, putting my N95 mask on. I was putting on my, you know, all this sort of stuff to protect myself when I was going to go in to see him. And I'll tell you, when I went into the room, he was in an isolation room, first of all, because that's where they need to put people uh, with COVID-19. The blind was closed. It was in the middle of the day. The, the room was dark, damp. The blind was closed. And I met the most ornery, depressed patient that you could possibly imagine. And uh, I tried to open the blind. His daughter was in the room with him. She was very thankful that I was there. And it was really just something just to try to get something out. And and the, the patient's questions to me were like, doc, is this bad? How much time do I have? Am I going to die? He was kind of focused on a lot of depressed type of things. And really, it was a dark room. It was, it was a horrible uh, environment in that room. And, uh, you know, my my job as a physician, of course, was to, uh, to try to treat him, make sure the medications were correct. But this little voice in the back of my head was, you know, you, you know what this guy needs. And this guy is not where he needs to be. The problem was, uh, obviously, this guy needed to be outside and get some sun. The problem was, is that he was on a lot of oxygen. Um, and that oxygen was coming from the wall of the hospital. There's a big tank there. And so uh, how are we going to get this guy outside? Well, the first thing I did was I opened the blind and I told the, the patient and his daughter, you need to keep this blind open during the day and closed at night. That was the melatonin aspect of it. By the way, I did start him on some melatonin at night only at night, about five milligrams for what it was worth. But I, I came out after I was done seeing that patient and I, I, I called the charge nurse and I called his nurse and I called our respiratory therapist who was taking care of him. And I'm like, and I told them and, and they know who I am. They know that, uh, you know, that I, I'm actually very interested in, in treating COVID patients and looking for alternative sources. And they're always willing and able to listen and ready to do whatever it is that, that needs to be done for their patients. It's so wonderful working with a team. And, and that that's one key point I want to emphasize is it's a team approach. I told them the situation. I told them what we wanted to do. There's a nice little area in this hospital that's a, little, a quad. It's surrounded by buildings on all four sides. And uh, it's there's a nice garden in there. Uh, there's trees. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful place where you can take the patient. And it's hardly ever used. So our respiratory therapist came up with a plan. She's like, Dr. Schwell, let's get two oxygen tanks together. We'll why them together. We'll do anything we need to do to get this guy in enough oxygen so we can get him in a wheelchair and we can wheel him outside into the sunlight. And I wrote an order in the chart. I said, this patient needs to get outside for 20 to 30 minutes every single day, direct sunlight. And, and you and I know that you don't need to have direct sunlight, but I'll tell you, this is the first time that I'd actually had the ability to prescribe this. So I wasn't going to take any chances. I want this guy in full, full sunlight. And so that's what we did. And, uh, and, uh, you know, he, he was hummed and hawed. He didn't want to do this. Why am I doing this? I said, we, he, he did. And he did, he told me later, he appreciated the energy that I brought to the room, um, and, and the, the optimism and we got him outside and he spent good 20 to 30 minutes in that sun. And uh, and then they took him back inside. And I, I was thinking to myself as I went home that night, I said, well, we'll see if it works. You know, it, it either is going to work or it's not going to work, but it's not going to deter me because what tells me whether or not something works or not is not the individual. It's the studies that tells me if something works, because it's built into that all of the different, uh, uh, you know, confounders. However. If something really works, there's nothing better than actually seeing it work in an individual human being who's in front of you, right? I mean, that's what we all do. We do studies not to know what works. We do studies because we want to help people and we want to do for them what's actually what's actually helping them. So the next day I came in and I almost kind of squinted as I uh, as I walked in and I'm like, how is our patient doing? How's he doing? And she said, well, he's down to just 15 liters of oxygen. I'm like, Really? And I'll tell you, Chef AJ, I've treated a lot of COVID patients. It's very rare to see that turnaround that quick. We got him outside again. The next day, 10 liters. The next day, six liters. The next day, four liters. The next day, they discharged him out of the hospital. <laughs> they didn't even tell me he was gone. He was home. And I called him up about a week later and I said, hey, can you give me permission to use your story? He said, absolutely, you can use it. You know what he told me? He said, doc, 
thank you very much. But he said, you know what, Doc? That very first day that I went out there, that sun felt so good. It felt so good to get out into that sun. You know, I, I don't know if it was the sun that did it or if it's the medicines that kicked in late, but I'll tell you this. He felt a lot better when he got out into the sun. And uh, I, I know that near-infrared radiation works because of a randomized controlled trial, but there's nothing that beats actually seeing it work in a patient. So I, uh, I wanted to tell everybody about this because think about the irony. The irony is, is that something that's named after the sun, corona, the corona radiata, would be the solution or at least a solution for a disease that also has the word corona in it. It's almost too obvious. But in looking at this, I worked with a, um, a professor at the University of Mexico by the name of Margaret Scutch, and she's a, uh, a geographer. And we, we looked at data from around the world, and we found that when you look at countries that have a high proportion of people with elevated BMIs, so what we'll call them fat countries, okay, that in those countries, latitude matters. The further, the closer you are to the equator, the less likely you're going to have mortality from COVID-19. It's a very broad, very broad um, uh, um, hypothesis generating type of study. It's nothing conclusive, but it's it's very it's very interesting to me. So, my advice to people, and this is what I try to do, is to get outside. Try to get as much light as you can, at least 20 to 30 minutes. I go outside and I eat my lunch uh, in the sun. For those of you uh, who are listening to Chef AJ's channel and you're interested in diet and what diet does to metabolic health, I'll tell you another study just really briefly where they did, where they didn't use near infrared light, but just red light. So this is a little bit in the visible spectrum. And what it showed was is that they did a randomized controlled trial where they where they did a glucose tolerance test. So people imbibed glucose and they showed very definitively that if you if you take in glucose in the presence of light, just a, a small amount of light on your back, okay, 800 square centimeters, I think it was, or 80 square centimeters, that um, the peak in glucose was less than in those that were not in light. So I believe eating in the presence of natural light helps with metabolic effects. There was a study that was done in Europe where it showed that, that people who'd had their blood drawn had better overall metabolic health if they had more days of sun in the previous seven days before they did that blood test. So here's the point. I think that technology is very beneficial for human uh, the human population, but it can also be very detrimental. Near infrared light is something that the human body <clears throat> has had available to it for uh, since its since its creation. Okay, and so therefore, what we're seeing now because of technology is less near infrared light. We have windows that block it for energy conservation. We have LED bulbs that don't make it because of energy conservation. We live in buildings because we have money to live in buildings. And, and it's the countries where people don't have money that don't have the money for LED bulbs, that don't have the money for near infrared blocking uh, windows, that have open air apartments that go outside to work and are in the sun. These are the countries that weathered COVID-19, the flu, these sorts of mitochondrial diseases much better than we did here in the United States. And so if you want the benefits of technology without the detriments of technology, what we need to do is to be wise as to how our human body works and do the following. Number one, turn off the lights after nine o'clock at night. Get off your uh, get off your, your computers, get off your iPhones, get off all of those things. The next day, get up in the morning, go outside, have breakfast outside, exercise outside. doesn't have to be uh, a lot of exercise, just a little bit of exercise. Get exposed to sunlight. You don't have to be in direct sun. You can cover up. You can be out in the green uh, areas, walk into the forest if you like. That's going to give you plenty of near infrared radiation without the damaging effects of ultraviolet light. If you do these things, you will be taking one of those letters in the new start, uh, um, the new start mnemonic, which is nutrition, exercise, water, sunlight, 
temperance, air, rest, and trust in a higher power. So that S in new start is sunshine. And what I've just told you here is basically I've unraveled that whole letter and told you how to leverage the understanding of circadian rhythm of our cells for the betterment. You don't have to understand all the science to get the benefits of it. You just need to be, you just have to have common sense and understand that when the sun is down, you should be avoiding light. And when the sun is up, you should be outside trying to get that light as much as possible. And I think Chef AJ, that sort of encapsulates what what the benefits are of sunlight, what the um, the reason is, what the evidence is, and kind of practical things that we can do as actionable things on an everyday basis to get the benefit of light. Well, you know, it's so funny because I was actually at a doctor's appointment with your friend, Dr. Nedley, and the text came in when you were talking to him about this. And it was, you say this wow. is anecdotal. And then like, this is so cool because it worked out and you talked about it today. So there's a couple of questions I have because I'm in my 60s and I've developed cataracts and my eye doctor is very strict about that. I need to wear sunglasses all the time outside, even if it isn't sunny. Is that going to affect my ability to absorb what you're saying we need now? It will affect the ability of light to get into your eyes. It will not affect, obviously, the ability in your skin. But I would say this is that cataracts are generally formed from ultraviolet radiation. And so if you want to get the benefits, again, what I would do if I were in your situation is I'm going to want to maximize infrared light and minimize ultraviolet light. So that means that the best thing for me to do in that situation would be to get out when the sun is either rising in the morning or setting in the evening into an area where that any kind of scattered light is going to be reflected back to me. So walking in a forest at a in the evening, walk or we're not necessarily a forest, but trees and grass at or either in the morning or in the evening. That's going to be the the best, and is and that, not wearing and not wearing sunglasses at that time. Okay, is there anything that we can buy for indoors for people that live places where there literally is no sun or there's always clouds? Sun lamps or those lights for people with seasonal affective disorder. Yes, thank you. Good question. So for, for seasonal affective disorder, this is not a near infrared light. This is a, a visible light, but that visible light is going to stimulate that part of your brain called the perihabenular nucleus that, and it's going to prevent seasonal affective disorder. The prescription would be a 10,000 lux light, which you can buy on Amazon for 20 bucks. And uh, you, were to, you, will, you should sit in front of it for about 20 minutes in the morning time when you're not getting sunlight and you should it should be about 11 to 15 inches from your eyes okay if you were to do that every day that has been shown to significantly reduce the incidence of seasonal affective disorder it affects about 4% of the population twice as when many women than men actually get this uh, condition but uh, that that would be the prescription now this has nothing to do with near infrared light and another question that comes up frequently is there a benefit to getting near infrared lamps here's the issue though is when you get out into the sun you are getting all of the different wavelengths in the near infrared spectrum Typically, when you buy a device online, it's going to be at a very specific uh, wavelength. And we don't have we don't have enough knowledge at this point. We don't have enough studies that show either that these devices have the same far reaching benefits of the sun. There are some studies that show that there is definitely benefits in the specific wavelengths. In fact, it's even used in medicine for wound healing, for all sorts of things nitric oxide production. There's a number of devices that are in the process of getting FDA approved, and we can cover some of those when, when we get more data. But uh, the, the amount of data that we have right now on the over-the-counter products that you can buy fairly cheaply, uh, including near-infrared saunas, we don't have as much data on that. And so it's hard to say with any certainty. I personally would not be surprised if there are health benefits to near infrared saunas. I just can't tell you that definitively without further studies. Great. Thank you. Can I ask you just a fun, silly question? Sure. What do you like better being a doctor or a YouTuber? Oh, you know, um, it, for me, I, I enjoy helping people and seeing people get better from the knowledge that I have gained. 
that really is where it comes into it for me. I just use the YouTube aspect to just kind of uh, um, to just kind of uh, leverage that ability to reach more people. And so I can treat more people. That's basically what I do. But I, you know, there is kind of like a, a perverse <laughs> thing of like people recognize who you are and it's like, oh, wow. Um, do your I, patients know that when they come to you? Because, you know, 1.54 million subscribers, it's no small thing. I'll, you know, a lot of them don't. And and I, I don't, I never tell any of my patients that I have a, a YouTube channel, unless of course, uh, I want them to see a specific video that would help them uh, with, with something. And that's not often. I usually just tell them right there. Uh, and, but if I don't have enough time, I might refer them to a video. But then there's other patients that I have that um, that uh, also come to see me because they know I'm a YouTube star. So yeah, uh, I, I get that. That's pretty cool. Well, congratulations on that. You know, I, I do watch your channel. It's a wonderful channel. I hope everyone will subscribe. But you don't seem to talk about diet very much compared to some of the other topics. Yes, um, we have talked a little bit about it. We did talk about it in relation to COVID. We showed, uh, for instance, that there was a study that um, a plant-based diet uh, actually reduced the incidence of severe COVID by almost four times. Uh, we did do a video on sialic acid, which is a, a substance, um, which I'm sure you're aware of, in red meats that uh, can actually cause inflammation. Um, there's there is a lot of there's a lot of disagreement and a lot of controversy out there in terms of of um, diet and nutrition. And, and so I try to uh, pick the most egregious errors and try to debunk those things uh, without causing a, a lot of a, a lot of controversy. And so it is it is an area that I am talking more and more about, but I'm doing it in a way that uh, that because because if you come right out and say these things, people will just throw everything out and say, you're obviously, you know, you're this, that and the other. But what I'm trying to show them is that there is credibility with some of these studies and uh, and honestly, the uh, unfortunately, because of the, of human nature and because of diets, it's it's we'll never be able to get a really good randomized controlled trial data. A lot of the data for diet and, and exercise is observational uh, because you can't force people to eat something and you can't randomize. the. We're not like rat, m mice in, in labs. Right. So the data is, is, is sometimes people will have difficulty with the data and they come to it from the perspective that they like their meat. They like the diet. Don't change my diet. I want to keep eating what the, my diet is. They also uh, obviously have issues uh, politically. Uh, a lot of what we eat is sometimes politically derived because of the the stances that the political parties have taken. And my my view is I'm apolitical. I, I could care less about what the politicians say, what the diet is and why we need to do things. My focus is, is what what we're eating should be the best for who we are as human beings, regardless of the politics. Do you ever and so I'm a firm believer that uh, a plant based diet is the best diet uh, for a number of reasons, the data. And of course, it's it's a basically trying to convince people of that. Do you ever get an opportunity, whether it's a, 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 a patient in your practice or an ICU to to discuss this with them? Oh, oh all the time. Yeah, I, I, I have a pac patients with strokes all the time. And 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 we we have discussions with families. I say, look. Here's uh, the the neurologist has recommended that the, you take aspirin, that you take Plavix, blah blah blah. They say, doctor, what else can I do? They don't even ask me. But sometimes I just tell them. I said, you you absolutely need to consider and switch to a plant based diet at this point. You need to actually. I say, I tell them the two for anybody who has a stroke, the two biggest interventions that you can do is something that a doctor is never gonna be able to prescribe for you. It's number one, it's diet and exercise. I actually had a neurologist come to me. He was a stroke neurologist. His job was to be at the stroke alerts when they came into the emergency room to decide, did they get TPA or did they not get TPA? That's the blood thinner that, that breaks up the clots. And he would look at the CAT scans. He would examine the patient, sometimes even remotely on a computer. And he, he turned to me one day and he says, you know what I am? You know what I am, Roger? He says, I'm basically a doctor for people who don't exercise. Mm. That's what he said. He said, I, I am, he says, he says, the studies are just overwhelmingly clear that diet and exercise and specifically exercise, he said in this case, this was his opinion, that exercise is so closely tied to stroke incidents that if people who, if people would just exercise, 
Um, and, and let me just say, people have all sorts of things in their mind. They think of when I say exercise, they think of you need to get out there and look like, you know, the people on the commercials for, you know, 24 hour fitness or whatever. No, really what we're talking about when we say exercise is to start moving. It's to stop being sedentary. It's to actually get up and do something that has tremendous benefits. And even if you're not able to do that, to do something that allows you to do that, get into a spa, get into a, a, a pool, get onto a stationary bicycle. There's always excuses, you know, I've got bad knees, but there's other exercises that you can do. Try to find it, be creative and do it. And, and it's an amazing amount of risk reduction that you get for strokes. Do you exercise? Do you have time? And how, what do you do? What do you <laughs> you do? know, I, my exercise is getting outside and, and, uh, and, and taking care of my garden and all of the the problems that, that pop up and repairing things. That's the exercise that I do. So yeah, I do get outside and I try to get sunlight. You know, that's the nice thing is that if you go outside to exercise, you're going to get sunlight too. Yeah. You can, you can, uh, get a good Double up. Yep. That's fantastic. Would you mind answering a few questions that you were sent in in advance? Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, this is from Betty. And she says, my 40 year old daughter has had serious shortness of breath accompanied with nausea and weakness from long term COVID. Both the lung and the heart doctors can't find anything wrong. Any thoughts? And I'm curious, though, in general, have you been seeing a lot of long COVID patients? Yes. And I'll tell you about one patient that I had when I started to, to, to read about this, I became excited because I believe it's a way to treat long COVID as well. I had a patient that came to me for a year with eight out of 10 shortness of breath and uh, could not get better. And he was very um, depressed about it. And I went through the entire workup, making sure that he did not have heart failure or blood clots. I went through and ruled out all of those things. And so when they were all ruled out and, and I still had him with breathing eight out of 10, I felt comfortable at that point recommending uh, what, what we just talked about today. So he got out in the sun and I had him do something else too. I had him do intermittent fasting. Uh, intermittent fasting is where you only eat two meals a day. He religiously from that point on did not eat anything after 530 in the afternoon. Why do I say to do this? Because again, circadian rhythm repair happens when you're sleeping and you don't go into ketogenesis. You don't go into that ability to repair for four or five hours after you put the last morsel of food in your mouth. So if he's going to bed at nine or 10 o'clock at night, he's just at that point kicking in to ketogenesis. And he's going to have the benefit of that for the entire night, uh, which is exactly what you need if you want to repair the things that are damaged in your body. I'm saying I'm I'm. I'm going over this with a very broad brush. I don't want to get into too much detail because I want to answer the question. Um, this gentleman, after having a year of suffering, eight out of 10, came back to me three weeks later, elated. He says, doc, the shortness of breath has gone from eight out of 10 down to three out of 10. My gastroesophageal reflux disease is gone. It's gone. It's completely gone. And I don't, and I don't eat any time after, not, not a morsel of food, you know, drinks water, that's fine, but not a morsel of food goes into his mouth after 5.30 in the evening, religiously. He was just floored that that, that small of a change, going outside, being in the sun, intermittent fasting would have that huge of an impact on a daily chronic illness that he had for a year. And uh, I've used this now on a lot of my patients and they are showing signs of improvement as well. I think that the things that we have done that made us susceptible to getting COVID are also the things that continue us in the disease of COVID and having long COVID. And getting out of that is, is going to be the same solution. And they're very simple solutions. You don't have to go to my website and buy a supplement. You don't have to, uh, I'm not going to sell this to you in a sub stack. These are things that are easily available to just about anyone. And it's basically free. Uh, yeah. I mean, you might have to buy a light box for 20 bucks from Amazon, but intermittent fasting costs no money. Do you do intermittent fasting? And if so, which meals or what? what I, I try to do that. Uh, it's hard for me because of my schedule, but it is possible, but you have to do it very, uh, you have to plan. And so uh, generally speaking, if I'm coming home late and there's a plate of food that my wife has left for me because I've been working late at the office or at the in the ICU, I, I won't eat that meal. I'll have it for the next day. So when you do it, do you skip more dinner or skip more breakfast? The reason I ask is, are you familiar with Dr. John Scharfenberg? He just turned 100 on Friday. No. He's, 
Well, okay. he, you'd love him. He's a wonderful Adventist doctor. Of, yeah. Dr. Nedley knows him. He's up here now. He's fantastic. He's 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 got millions of YouTubers too. I mean, it's incredible. But he's been intermittent fasting pretty much his whole life, but he chooses to skip dinner. And uh, he thinks that's one of the secrets. I think that, I think he's absolutely correct. And I'll tell you why. Uh, it's because of our circadian rhythm. So if you were to uh, very briefly, it, it, we are finding out in science that um, we are a completely different person metabolically in the morning than we are in the evening. And, and that has nothing to do with how we feel. It has to do with our circadian clocks. These are biological clocks that are ticking. And what we've discovered is that in the human body, insulin, the body's reaction to insulin is the most sensitive in the morning and not in the evening. So that what does that mean? That a calorie ingested in the morning is dealt with much more efficiently in terms of insulin than a calorie ingested in the evening. And so uh, I used to intermittent fast and skip breakfast. And why did I do this? Was because my kids were gone already off to school and uh, they would come home and, and dinner was a social uh, thing. And that's a natural thing. Like you'd wanna sit around the table, talk about the day it eats. That's a natural thing in our society to do that. Um, it's just, unfortunately, our circadian rhythm is not designed for that. And so uh, a lot more insulin is necessary to ingest and, and to digest food in the evening. And so I switched it. And, and again, a lot of people might do intermittent fasting for the purpose of losing weight. That's not the purpose of intermittent fasting. It, it might be a, and it is a known, a known effect of intermittent fasting. But again, the key here with intermittent fasting is quality, not quantity. In other words, I want to, if you're going to be 150 pounds, I want to be 150 pounds of quality material and not 150 pounds of, of garbage. And I think that's the, that's what intermittent fasting does is it allows the body to break down bad things that have been tagged molecularly for destruction so that it can do this during the nighttime when it's, when it's supposed to do it. Think about Disneyland. My, I had a friend that used to work at Disneyland, but he worked there at night. He was part of the cleaning crew. When Disneyland shuts down at 11 p.m., there's a whole host of things that happen that the public never sees. Uh, the rides are shut down. The engineers come in and check the rides. The cash registers are cleared out. The stores are restocked. The, the gardening happens. The weeding happens at night. So that when Disneyland opens at whatever time it opens in the morning, it's this pristine, brand new uh, amusement park that's ready for the day. You know, Disneyland is complex, but boy, our human body is far more complex than Disneyland. And so, uh, so how much more do we need that ability to digest, rest, and to repair? And if we don't get that opportunity, Chef AJ, the problem is, is that these cells can lead to uh, cancer, uh, can lead to improper functioning, being tired. And this is exactly what my patient had. And when he started to allow his body to do what it was wanting to do all this time, it had so many things tagged for destruction and, and breakdown and then rebuilding, but it never got a chance to get to it. And, and that's the problem. So- is there still a benefit to doing the skipping breakfast and narrowing the feeding window if somebody isn't willing to skip dinner? Because you're right, that's the social time. I would love to be done with eating, you know, by four, but I can't get the husband to do it. And, you know, <laughs> then I have to eat on my, on my, you know, that's the time. Sometimes it's the only time people come together. Yeah. You know, it's, it's possible, but you know, if you wanted to row your boat, would you rather row your boat upstream or row your boat downstream? everybody wants to row their boat downstream and skipping breakfast is rowing your boat upstream. Skipping dinner is rowing your boat downstream. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Boy. <laughs> okay. Hey, okay. This question is from Lori and she said, is there any way to treat sarcoidosis without going on long-term high dose steroids? She's concerned about the weight gain and the osteoporosis. Yeah, it's complicated because there's there's four stages of sarcoid. Uh, stage one and two generally doesn't need to be treated with steroids and it remits on its own. <clears throat> and that can be determined based on the chest X-ray if there's hyalur lymph nodes and things of that nature. She probably is talking about stage three and four uh, sarcoid, which unfortunately has already gotten into the lungs. And uh, immunosuppressants like steroids are designed to reduce the inflammation that's occurring in the lung and prevent further destruction of the lung. And so that's really what the studies have shown. Um, and so unfortunately, that's we, we hope that the steroids stop it, but uh, taking on a little bit more of a healthier diet 
and, and getting into the sunshine, all of these things have been shown to mitigate inflammatory conditions. Like we can talk about a number of autoimmune conditions of which sarcoid is just one of them, that getting vitamin D supplementation, uh, getting out into the sun can help with that. So I, I think a, a good approach here would be to, to take the steroids at the, if the if the doctor is recommending that and be under the care of the physician but at the same time and this works for this philosophy works with many diseases do all those lifestyle changes get in there and do it what it needs to do and you might notice that perhaps uh, you remit more quickly and you you can get off those medications faster thank you uh, Sheba said that she appreciates the videos and she followed your advice and took a family member outside three times a day and added nigella seeds to a nutrient plant-based meals when she had COVID. She wants to know, do you think it's possible to create sunlight rooms in hospitals using windows that don't block the beneficial rays in a small number of rooms designed for this purpose? I live in Canada where it is not feasible to take patients outside in the winter. You know, this is exactly how we used to build hospitals. <clears throat> there was a, a neurosurgeon at my hospital and she trained in Seattle at the old county hospital there. And she told me there flat out, this building is over a hundred years old. And there was these huge solariums under glass uh, that they would take the patients to in the wintertime when it was too cold to go outside. But it was designed in a way that you could remove the glass in the summertime and allow the fresh air and 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 the benefits of being outside in. So not only is it possible, we've done it. We've just moved away from it uh, because of efficiencies that needed to ha happen and uh, and all sorts of other pressures that we felt that um, apparently that sunlight and fresh air wasn't as important as we uh, once thought it was. And I think that's unfortunate and I think it is important. And I think that um, as there has been a re-understanding of health of sick buildings and healthy buildings, like Dr. Joseph Allen who is sort of leading that cause. He's the one that coined the term sick buildings and forever chemicals. And he's recently written a number of books on how buildings need to be healthy in terms of ventilation. So he's done a, an amazing work on ventilation. I think that we need to have a similar rebirth when it comes to the understanding of light in those buildings as well. Right. You want to get into the controversial ones now, which I don't oh, like, sure. anything, but um, there's two questions on vaccines. Uh, one has been submitted anonymously. And the person said, if you had five COVID shots with the last one over a year ago and had COVID once this year, would you recommend more shots or just consider you did enough? And what are your thoughts on Paxlovid? Okay. So Paxlovid, I think is a, uh, let's start with that one first. That's a medication that, um, can, can shorten the effects of, of the, 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 the flu or the, um, hospitalization from COVID. Uh, I think a recent study showed that it reduced hospitalization by 50%. So, you know, I, again, according to my philosophy, I want to do anything I can to help the patient. I don't care. Uh, you know, all I need is data. That's what I'm interested in data. I want to look at risks and benefits and so if I have somebody who is sick with COVID and who is at high risk for going on to hospitalization, I don't want that to happen. And so I'm going to get them out into the sunlight. I'm going to do hydrotherapy, which we can talk about another time, uh, which is basically a way of, of creating a fever. But boy, I would be remiss if I didn't also use every tool in the tool shed and get them on Paxlovid as well. I mean, I recently actually had a family member in this very situation, and that's exactly what we did. We did sunlight, we did hydrotherapy, and we did Paxlovid. You know, um, if we ever have another pandemic and our supply chain breaks down, we might not have the ability to have access to medicines like Paxlovid or vaccinations or things of this nature. And uh, and I'll feel reasonably well because I have these other interventions that I've learned to do. But if I have if I have the access to these to these medications that can also help, you know, why not? I I, I my goal is is not to be on any uh end of a false dichotomy that says one thing or the other. My goal 100% is to save my patient's life and to save them from disease and illness. And so, you know, in terms of the other question, uh, five vaccinations, recent COVID, it's really uh, a risk benefit ratio in terms of what it is that we're looking for. So if somebody is relatively healthy, if somebody uh, doesn't have pre-morbid conditions and someone's not really interested in protecting themselves from being infected, but they just wanna make sure they don't get hospitalized, I think five shots is probably plenty and you're, you're probably not going to end up in the hospital. I think it's very unlikely. If on the other hand, they have uh, comorbid conditions, they're immunosuppressed, 
and they're very concerned about getting infected because they have other members around them that are also sick or they have cancer, then uh, I think the evidence might indicate, especially if there's a surge that's uh, occurring, that it, it might be beneficial to to get um, to get the vaccine. So it's a nuanced decision. There's a lot of that goes into it. A lot of things that you would have to know about their medical situation. You would have to know their medical chart. And so because of this, and I've always said it, I think the best the best situation is have a discussion between the patient and the, the physician or the provider that's taking care of that patient and come up with an idea and understanding. I think that's why I have I was kind of a little bit, I uh, had dim vision on, on uh, mandates because it really didn't take any of that into consideration. So um, that's where I would go with that. Great, thank you. And this other question is from another anonymous viewer who's 72, is five foot two and 180 pounds, doesn't have a thyroid, says has no medical conditions, wanted to know if they should get the new COVID vaccine and the RSV vaccine. Uh, she already got the 65 plus flu vaccine. And, and she she's 70 years old? Or 72. 72. So, you know, when you get to that age, I, I've seen patients in the intensive care unit with RSV and it's not nice. Um, and so, uh, if they're, if they want to prevent hospitalization, then this would be something that I think, uh, and it sounds as though they have some, some, some conditions that might predispose them to getting sick. And, um, uh, so yeah, I think, I think it's a reasonable thing to, to go ahead and get those vaccinations. They've been shown to reduce the incidence of these things. And so, you know, the thing about vaccines is you never know if they work, right? Uh, if you don't get something, how do you know that you didn't get something? So uh, that's why we need to do studies. And the studies have shown that these things actually uh, reduce. It's not 100%, but it's, it's again, it's, it's a, a, another tool in the tool chest. And that's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in anything that's going to reduce the, uh, the, 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 the ability to get sick. It's kind of like what we do in the operating room. So if you're going to go in for surgery, the thing that we don't want to have is a post-op complication. We don't want to have an infection. And so we could say that, well, we sterilized all the equipment. We don't need to wear a mask in the operating room. We don't need to uh, wear sterile gloves. We don't need to have positive pressure ventilation. But that that's not the philosophy. Uh, we want perfection uh, when we're talking about treating people. We, we can't afford to have anything but perfection. And so to prevent people from getting infected in the operating room, we will wear a mask to prevent us from spitting into the wound uh, when we're talking, uh, asking for instruments. We will sterilize all the instruments. We will have positive pressure ventilation in the room so that air escapes out of the room rather than air coming into the room. We will have a scrub nurse. We will uh, scrub our hands. We will use sterilization liquid on the wound. We will do all of these things because all of these things work together to get the final goal, which is no post-op infection. And that's how I see treating any other kind of disease. I'm going to do everything I can that shows that has data to, to do that. Great. Thank you. Maybe just time for one live question. Dar says, Dr. Schwelt, are you still taking NAC during winter months? Yes, exactly. I just took it this morning. So, and this is based on a study that actually Dr. Neil Nedley pointed out. It was done back in 1997. And it's where they put people on NAC 600 milligrams twice daily orally for six months during a winter season. And it showed that the symptomatology, it didn't, it didn't reduce the incidence of the flu, but it reduced the symptomatology so that instead of 80 or so percent of people coming down with severe or, or flu-like symptoms, only 25%. And again, if you think about this, uh, what does NAC do? NAC is N-acetylcysteine. It is a substance that replenishes glutathione uh, peroxidase, which is a antioxidant. Again, uh, uh, it's this oxidative stress issue. And so the flu mitigates a lot of its symptomatology, a lot of its uh, uh, side effects through oxidative stress. And what does NAC do? NAC improves the oxidative stress of your body. By the way, as we, as we referenced earlier, there was a study that showed that sunlight also is extremely beneficial for reducing the incidence of influenza. And uh, as we've just talked about with melatonin, melatonin is also a very powerful antioxidant. So what are some other things, uh, since we're on Chef AJ, I'm gonna say this. <laughs> what are some other things that you can do to improve your oxidative stress? You need to eat things that have a lot of antioxidants in them. So things that end in berry, right? Anything, uh -huh. strawberries, blueberries, these are all, these are all packaged 
These are like little packaged pills from from nature that are there for your benefits. Uh, just think about this. I like like just sit back and think about this one thing. Okay, we consume oxygen, and we give off carbon dioxide. Okay, think about the leaves on a tree. Think about a, think about a, um, a a tree or a bush. So this bush makes strawberries or, or little plant strawberries or blueberries or whatever so that you can eat and get antioxidants. But what does the leaves do? The leaves takes your carbon dioxide that you don't need, that you want to get rid of, and it turns it into oxygen, which you do need. And the leaves reflect near infrared light that makes the mitochondria that's processing all of these gases nice and cool. It's like the leaves are, without leaves on a tree, what would we be? right? It's it's amazing how integrated we are, if you think about this, how integrated we are as human beings with nature around us. And it's it's just so amazing. Well, you are amazing, Dr. Schmuel. Thank you so much for your time. And I'd love to hear more about hy hydrotherapy because that's something I don't know about. So maybe you'll come on again. Oh, it's amazing stuff. Yep. All right. Thanks so much. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in 28 minutes for Dr.